we have our next speaker, Dr. Baskar Srinivasan himself, who's a senior consultant in the cornea department at uh, Shankar Netralia, has great interest in the ocular surface diseases. And he's going to be talking to us on management options in recalcitrant VKC. One to you, something again, very important to all of us. Thank you, ma'am. I'll just share my slide. Yeah. So very good, uh, a very good evening. And I'll be speaking on recalcitrant VKC and the management options, no financial disclosures. So basically, uh, we look at the classification of allergic eye disease, look at the clinical features, uh, grading of VKC, and look at uh, the complications and the medical and surgical measures that we might uh, be uh, required to take in these cases and look at some interesting cases. So uh, um, allergic eye disease is a very common condition and generally uh, you can have a genetic basis to it. You could have pollution, which could cause most of the uh, cases that we see in India. And uh, if you look at classification, obviously you, you know it's seasonal, perennial, you have VKC, AKC, GPC. And here today we are gonna be talking about uh, VKC and we're gonna be specifically looking at recalcitrant uh, forms of the disease. In general, VKC is uh, defined as a chronic bilateral uh, allergic eye disease, which affects the pediatric age group primarily. But we now know that it can persist in adults. And sometimes you can also see what is called as an adult onset VKC-like uh, disease, which is a newer description. It could either have a tarsal form, a bulbar form, or a mixed form of the disease. And when you're looking at clinical features, itching is the most important symptom that a, a patient with allergy would give, apart from all the other uh, non-specific complaints that the patient gives. When you're looking at clinical features, papillae, whether it is in the tarsal conjunctiva or whether it is at the limbus, are one of the most important signs that you would see. Apart from the presence of hornotrantas dots in active disease, you can also look at perilimbal pigmentation as a sign of a VKC disease activity. And what we are all worried about is corneal epithelopathy or changes secondary on, to, on the cornea secondary to the severity of the allergic eye disease. And obviously, we're looking at complications such as limbal stem cell deficiency, keratoconus, or the complications due to medical measures in terms of glaucoma. So when you're looking at tarsal papillae, you can grade the papillae less than uh, 0.3, less than 1 mm. But what we are more worried about is if the papillae are huge and they are called as giant papillae when they are more than 1 mm in size. And when you have multiple confluent papillae, they can have what is called as a cobblestone appearance. And when you have pseudomembranes or discharge sticking in between this uh, papillae, it's what is called as a Maxwell lion sign. If you're looking at a tarsal papillae and you stain it, and if the surface of the uh, papillae is staining, it indicates a bit of an active disease. Just like when you look at hornotantas drop, the, the, the apex of these, uh, these nodules will actually stain. Similarly, when you're looking at a tarsal papillae, if the surface stains, it indicates an activity. If the surface is smooth, it indicates it's, it's an inactive phase of the disease where you might not have to treat it much except for the cosmesis in terms of it causing a lid uh, tosis as such if, if it is huge. When you're looking at a limbal papillae, it can sometimes be uh, gelatinous uh, in a confluent area, which is called as a pseudogeron toxin. And what we just described about in terms of hornotantas dots, you can see these whitish excrescences at the head of the uh, limbal papillae, which are basically eosinophilic uh, accumulation as such. Perilimbal pigmentation was described by Dr. SKR as one of the uh, signs of uh, VKC. So when you're looking at corneal involvement, which we are all aware, uh, all worried about, because that's what finally affects the vision of the patient, it could either lead to punctate, punctate erosions, it could lead to coarse epithelopathy, and it could lead to macro erosions. And Bonini and uh, our own Nikhil Gokhale has given a classification with respect to VKC. In Bonini's classification, you're basically looking at quiescent, mild intermittent, intermittent, moderate intermittent, moderate persistent, and then severe, very severe, and in an evol evolutionary phase, where it's basically a burnt out disease. So what we are basically worried about when we, when we say a recalcitrant is anything which is worse than grade 2B, which is moderate and persistent. Anything which is moderate and it's intermittent and it settles down with your topical anti-allergics or a short course of topical steroids, you're probably not worried. But when you are not able to get the patient off topical steroids or the severity or the frequency is such that you're worried about visually significant complications, then that is what you would label it as a recalcitrant uh, VKC as such. So when you're looking at the Nikhil Gokhale's publication in IGO, he's also probably looked at it in the same manner, grading it as mild, moderate, moderate, chronic, and severe and blinding. So obviously anything in the blinding group comes under recalcitrant. Everything in the severe and the moderate chronic comes under recalcitrant. And what does, uh, what are the features that come under uh, moderate and severe is primarily whenever you have limbal deficiency, when you have severe corneal involvements in terms of a shield ulcer, or you have corneal scarring, panis, conjunctival granulomas, which are large. So every time that your cornea is involved on a more repeated basis, or it is visually threatening, is something that we are going to be concerned about. And we would want to avoid that or address it as best as we could. Sorry. 
So when you're looking at managing uh, allergic conjunctivitis, you have the option of medical, surgical, and desensitization. I'll probably stick to medical and surgical because my experience with desensitization is very, very limited as such. So when you're looking at uh, management protocol, which Nikhil has mentioned in his paper, again, you start off with avoidance, then you go off to lubricants, then you go into mast cell stabilizers, you go to pulse uh, lotopredinols, and once it doesn't respond to that, you go to higher frequency steroids. If it is recurring once, your steroid is stopped and you want to get the patient off topical steroids, then you would go on to a topical cyclosporine or topical tacrolimus. We found tap top topical tacrolimus to work much better. At least the tolerance is much better than topical uh, cyclosporine 2% um, as such. For further complications in terms of uh, severe tarsal papillae, which need treatment, you might want to consider supratarsal steroids. But when you're giving supratarsal steroids, you need to be sure you need to be careful that they don't develop a uh, glaucoma secondary to the steroid. And in certain cases where, in spite of all the efforts, it is not settling down, you might want to put the patient on systemic medications. It could be a short course of systemic steroids. But if it recurs again, once the systemic steroid is given, you can't keep the patient endlessly on systemic steroids, whereby you might want to consider systemic immunosuppression. Uh, in systemic immunosuppression for allergy, uh, cyclosporine or tacrolimus is probably the drug of choice at this point of time. Again, when you're looking at VKC versus AKC, the role of systemic medication is much more established in AKC as compared to uh, VKC as such. If you develop corneal problems, then you are looking at uh, uh, a shield ulcer management will be which will be coming to subsequently and uh, when you have very large giant papillae you might want to consider excision again i'll discuss that uh, later so looking at the complications uh, i'll probably be focusing more on uh, shield ulcer amongst the list of uh, complications here so when you look at shield ulcer the grading is uh, when the shield ulcer is uh, the epithelial there is an epithelial defect but the base is clear where there's an inflammatory debris at the base, uh, it's grade two. And when you have an elevated plaque at the base, it's grade three. Why is it important to know the difference is if there is an elevated plaque, it's not going to respond to just medical measures. You will have to debride the elevated plaque so that the epithelium is able to grow across that area and cover it. It's generally described as an oval or a pentagonal lesion, which is superficial and it's located nearly cl close to the visual um, axis. And why are we worried about it? Because it could lead to a corneal scar. It could get secondarily infected and ultimately could result in a decrease in vision. So this is the picture showing the various grades, a grade one, uh, where the base is clear. Uh, there's still a, it's a slightly growing from a grade one to grade two, because this part, the base is clear. This part, the base is translucent. This is a grade two where the base is translucent. And this is a grade three where there's an elevated plaque sitting at the base. So here you will have to debride it. Only then will the uh, ulcer heal. How do you treat a shield ulcer? If it is a grade one or a grade two, you might want to put a bandage contact lens. You will start a treatment with topical steroids. Look for the healing. If it doesn't heal the, in a week's time, you might want to take the patient up surgically for an amniotic uh, membrane for facilitating the healing. For a grade three, you will have to debride it. You could debride it and put a bandage lens and start the patient on topical steroids. Or if it's a child and you're anyway taking the child under general anesthesia, you might actually just put an amniotic so that it facilitates and first uh, a faster healing of the epithelium. So this is a patient with uh, AKC who presented with a shield ulcer and we put her on a bandage contact lens because it looks like a grade one. We put her on a bandage contact lens, hiked up the topical steroids. Uh, we sent her to the dermatologist to start her on systemic uh, uh, tacrolimus. Uh, the defect did not heal in a week's time. So we had to do an amniotic membrane. But after that, she was uh, stable. So you need to, in certain situations, you need to use systemic medications to control the uh, allergic process. So coming to GPC per se, you have uh, the treatment options are topical steroids, immunomodulators, systemic steroids or immunomodulators. You could use uh, cryo to, uh, to, to be applied to the papillae. You could use supratarsal steroid injection. And uh, the last one, which is not very commonly used, would be excision along with uh, mitomycin or along with an amniotic membrane or along with a uh, conjunctival autograft or uh, along with mucous membrane graft. So... Um, We've tried excision with uh, amniotic alone, where uh, our, our results were not very good, even though uh, Amit Kherka's group has published a fairly good result with uh, excision of the papillae with the amniotic membrane alone. Um, pa Paolo Dantas et al. have excised this giant papillae and replaced it with bulbar conjunctiva. Uh, we were a bit concerned with using the conjunctiva more because the bulbar conjunctiva is also exposed to the same allergic stimulus that the tarsal conjunctiva is exposed to. These are eyes who might require further surgeries as far, as far as glaucoma surgeries are concerned. So we didn't want to touch the conjunctiva as such. And histologically, the conjunctiva is probably going to behave in a similar manner. 
with our experience with mucous membrane grafting for uh, lid margin keratinization in, in MMG, we thought it might be easier to excise these papillae and replace it with a buccal mucous membrane graft. The advantage being histologically mucosa behaves differently. It doesn't have the same allergic tendency as uh, for VKC kind of a response as compared to a conjunctiva. And whenever we have done a mucous membrane graft in these eyes, there has not been any recurrence of papillae in that uh, area of the mucosa because histologically it doesn't have the septa, septa and doesn't behave in a way that it is going to give rise to a papillary formation. You will see okay. papillary okay. Okay. area of, of your uh, uh, mucosa that you have uh, done. Cosmetically, it doesn't cause a blemish. And Im immunologically also, mucosa is supposed to be having some kind of an anti-allergic uh, properties as compared to conjunctive. So we're looking at certain case scenarios now. So this was a patient with a grade 2B Bonanese classification, mild disease, honotrantas dots will do well with dual acting medications. If the honotrantas dot doesn't respond, you might give a short course of topical uh, low dose steroid. Whereas with a grade 3 with a persistent symptom, you can see the staining of the tarsal papillary uh, uh, papillae also. There are honotrantas dots in the limbus also. So this patient was started off with topical steroids and olopatadine and then maintained on topical tacrolimus to reduce the dependence on uh, topical steroid. Another patient with a grade 3 to 4 with significant uh, corneal changes also uh, and with keratoconus. Here it is important to control the disease activity with uh, topical steroids first, add on topical immun immunomodulators. Once the disease is under, under control, then you tackle the keratoconic uh, component. He underwent a lamellar keratoplasty in one eye and a cross linkage in the other eye. Another patient with a significant limbal stem cell deficiency, uh, no other systemic ailments, was on all medications. Uh, it was uh, worse, getting worse. Uh, he had to shift or relocate to a different place. And finally, that is what actually uh, helped him because after shifting from that uh, location, his uh, eye became a lot more quieter. There was uh, the episodes of allergy became less. So even though it is, it might not be practical in all cases, sometimes uh, getting a history as to where does he get his exas exacerbation from can make a difference in uh, managing the disease as such. This was a patient with a very severe grade 4 uh, VKC with a shield ulcer with systemic uh, ATOP also. And uh, he underwent a debridement with amniotic for the shield ulcer. We had given supratarsal steroids. We reviewed with the dermatologist who changed the tacrolimus to picrolimus skin ointment. He was also given systemic inhalers which contained steroid for his rhinitis. So probably the combination of the inhalers and the uh, change in picrolimus uh, in change in, from tacrolimus to picrolimus made a difference. But when you studied literature, both seem to work uh, equally. There's no significant difference. But there are some studies which say that for atopic dermatitis in certain situations, picrolimus works better than uh, tacrolimus as such. Again, a patient with severe VKC with uh, tarsal form of VKC, you can see the ptosis. For him, also, we had done the maximum medical measures. We did cryotherapy and supratarsal steroid. You could see a decrease in the papillae. And then after again a couple of months, there was a recurrence gave oral steroids, it quit, settled down again after uh, after a few months recurrence. And then when we finally did uh, an MMG for him, after that almost, now it's almost about four years, there has not been a recurrence of uh, the papillae and you can see the smooth surface uh, indicating the uh, lack of mechanical uh, irritation that will cause on the ocular surface. So it's not that it, it, is, it is the first choice, it's only once you finish all your armamentarium that you have, and it is still not getting under control, then you are left with two choices. Either put the patient on systemic immunosuppression or you ex excise the papillae and manage it locally. We thought we should first give a chance to, to a local management before deciding to put the patient on long-term systemic uh, immunosuppression. Another patient with a grade four with very large papillae, Again, uh, and in fact, in two weeks, you can see that the, the eye is significantly quietened down. And uh, the patient who required systemic steroids to even allow us to evaluate the child in the OPD was walking comfortably in the OPD with the uh, eyes open. This is the other eye of the same patient showing uh, how the ocular of uh, the impact of this kind of a papillae on the ocular surface is something that you all would be uh, able to understand. This is another subset where we have seen that in patients with immunosuppression, so this boy was a 12-year-old boy with uh, HIV since birth, and uh, when you uh, have a worsening of your immune status, you tend to have a worsening of the uh, allergy as such. So if you have an adult onset patient, or if you have your uh, VKC, which is not getting controlled, 
kindly check the immune status uh, of the patient. So uh, the moment the CD4 counts uh, improved, this uh, patient, uh, the allergic symptoms were a lot easier for us to control. So this is what is labeled as the TH1, uh, TH2 immune shift. This was another adult onset uh, mixed VKC kind of a disease patient who was around 30, year, 30 years old. And he had his history only for the last few months on and off uh, topical prednisolone. And again, once you, uh, he had stopped his heart, once you go back to the history, if you can find out if he's not, then get an HIV test done to be sure, because it's not common to have a VKC at an adult uh, onset disease, even though it's a described phenomena now, but if it's not getting under control with conventional measures, it's looking atypical with respect to age of presentation, then check the immune status uh, of the patient. And once the immune status improved, the allergy significantly settled. And this is what we published earlier. This was a child with VKC with uh, severe corneal involvement with molluscum. And he had to be shifted to a third line heart until he was shifted to a third line heart and the uh, immune status improved. We couldn't get him off topical steroids at all. And if you look at the eye, it looks almost as if there's a complete limbal deficiency. You can't make out anything about the anterior chamber uh, details. And this is the same patient almost now 12 years down the line. Uh, his vision has improved from the counting fingers when he came, when the picture was taken the last time, to around 618. With the pros, he's improving to 6-7.5 uh, in both the eyes. Um, and his disease is under control more because his uh, HIV status is under control with uh, the third, uh, third line regime of heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baskar. There was nothing left. You gave us a beautiful, thorough picture. Thanks so much. I'm going to ask a very basic uh, question and Dr. Merle, can you take it? Like, what would be your timing of doing cross-linking? Uh, I mean, they are a patient with keratoconus and they have EKC. So when would you do cross-linking? What would be a time frame and uh, what would be under cover of what? So, so, usually in the, so, so this is like a kind of a devil in a deep blue sea situation because you have patients with active allergy who have keratoconus who most likely are going to have borderline corneas and you need to cross-link them fast. So I don't think there's any magic drug that we would use. Um, we usually put patients on uh, topical steroids, give them a quick course, put them on a mast cell stabilizer. My personal favorite and what I found has been very effective um, has been chromal fort, that is uh, sodium chromoglycate 4%. Uh, as opposed to the dual action drugs, I found that in kids, Chromal fort works much better. While in adults who have um, allergy that comes in, uh, usually we get you know a good effect with either you know olopatadine or something alkaftadine or something like that. But I've not had that good experience with chromal fort with you know with these drugs in children. So that's what we put them on. Then we add the um, tacrolimus and make sure that these patients have at least you know three months of quiescence. There has to be less inflammation on the eye. Um, and then proceed with cross-linking in that scenario. Yes. Yeah, if, could, if I could just add, because if, you're, if your cornea has issues with the allergic eye disease itself, the basic test that you're going to do to look for progression itself becomes uh, uh, inac inaccurate. Right. Yeah. So you need to treat the disease first in terms of your allergy, make sure that your cornea is clear, then get your topography because that is going to be your baseline for you to compare whether there's progression or not. And then maybe a two or three months of the eye being quiet, I might want to just continue the to low-dose topical steroids and topic or, uh, or put him on topical tacrolimus uh, during the period to make sure that it is quiet. Second, when we are doing the cross-linkage in these eyes, my threshold to take the patient up into the, to the OR to do an amniotic is going to be much lesser. So by, the, by a week's time, if I feel the defect is uh, not healed, because normally you would expect it to heal in about fourth, fourth or the fifth day latest, by a week, if it has not healed, I might just take the patient up, put an amniotic. I don't want the, the cornea to be deepithelized, uh, leading to a haze or a scar, which adds on to our problems in the post-operative uh, uh, visual recovery uh, as such. Sir, one quick question. Your uh, uh, views on using systemic cyclosporin in VKC patients, where they don't have really have systemic atopy, because systemic atopy generally a dermatologist is taking care but what subset of patients with, would you use systemic cyclosporin as a steroid sparing agent? So, I mean, this has always been a debate in a sense. Um, if you look at um, uh, the LVP publications, they go more by systemic uh, immunosuppression. So, the group in VKC that you're going to be looking at systemic suppression are primarily patients with giant papillae who end up with shield ulcer. So, our uh, if there is no other systemic issue which is there, 
we would uh, we would probably look at targeting the uh, the papillae surgically if it recurs after that we would uh, put the patient on systemic immunosuppression the it's the other school of thought would be i don't want to take the patient up for surgery because even with steroids when you give it for a short period of time you do see a recurrence of i mean you see the papillae reduces so the idea would be okay i i don't want to su subject the child to a surgery but i'm okay with monitoring their uh, side effects of the tablets and i would put them on systemic so it's not that this way is right or that way we felt it's a, if your local problems are more and it is something which we can address locally i don't have to subject the child to uh, these medications because again you're going to be keeping these medications for at least a year year and a half and then you're going to be tapering or uh, stopping the medications at the so now you're not looking at one month or two month of uh, systemic immunosuppression you're looking probably close to at least two or three years till they reach a, pu pu uh, a pubertal age where you feel the disease itself intensity itself is kind of coming down and you are able to stop it as such so you, you would prefer in a active gpc with a mechanical effect you would rather uh, side towards an uh, mucous membrane no, that's why i said it's not that it's not that all gpcs require surgery even if you have a very large papillae there but the surface of the papillae is not taking up stain your cornea is not taking up stain then the only reason for excision if at all would be a cosmetic ptosis which the papillae is causing which you have to discuss with the patient whether they want it to be done for that if that is not the case then most of the times once you're with tacrolimus and with uh, i mean at least with tacrolimus we've been able to control most of it even in sn for that matter over the last uh, almost like 18 years or so we've done a papillary excision only in 13 patients so it's not something that we would advise uh, uh right left and center even if you look at lvp the number of patients who have to be put on systemic immunosuppression is is a is a small subset it's not like a huge subset so you're, you're talking about using it only when you are not able to control it with local measures to a large extent tacrolimus has been a boon for us because that has significantly reduced the need for us to do anything more thank you we shall now we want to add one thing i think uh, Bhaskar pointed out many aspects but yeah. I think uh, uh, in VKC and in the pediatric age, which presents with the limbal form, we talk a lot about the giant papillary form. The limbal form is the one which is very difficult to manage because quite often it leads to encroachment into the visual axis and you end up, you know, having a panel sort of. Yes. Those cases, I think uh, the management overall has been to Mr. look into the absolute eosinophil count and high like, uh, serum Ig levels. If that is high, they actually are sort of controlled with Montelukas. The other thing is that immunosuppressants should be sort of uh, required, should be a mandate for those patients who go into a perennial form of VKC. Because even though it may not be, you start with a very low dose, like something like what you start in RN, very low dose. And then the frequency of recurrences I've seen in my experience, they come down a lot. Like it will not tide over the acute crisis, which happens. But the frequency of recurrences which happen that is sort of settled with the perennial form. So I think the limbal form, I think, is equally dangerous than the ones, the papillary yeah. form. The limbal form will end up with a limbal deficiency as such. So, and you can't go ahead and excise it or do anything for it. So you will have to uh, put the patient on topical. And if it is not responding to that, you might want to put the patient on systemic uh, immunosuppression to control because there is the inflammatory component, which is damaging the limbus. You need to protect it as, as best uh, as you could. Um, Sometimes what we assess as, uh, like, like I showed the picture, what initially when you looked at the picture, you felt that there is actually a, a, a limbal deficiency in the last photo that uh, I showed of the HIV patient um, as such. But once the inflammation comes down quite a bit, there is probably residual cells which kind of take over and you are able to establish it. So those kind of patients, yes, you will probably need to give immunosuppression to kind of control the disease. So you will have to, it has to be there in your armamentarium. You need to be wise when you would want to use it, and if you're wanting, if you're going to be using it, you need to be very clear with your uh, follow-ups and your uh, side effect profile that you will need to manage. Thank you. Yeah. If I may add something, yes, yes, Doctor Anand. Yeah, so I, I think fantastic discussions here, and as rightly pointed out, it's going to be the morbidity of the disease which is going to decide on uh, our step ladder approach and what we introduce when. And uh, we did look at uh, uh, the use of, uh, uh, you know, topical tacrolimus eye ointment, 0.1%, one, uh, uh, which I now have started using over the lids of these children. 
because uh, these children, tacrolimus is very irritating, uh, irritant to the eyes, and children do not tolerate it when you use it in into the uh, into the uh, conjunctival phonics as compared to cyclosporin. Yeah. So uh, I use cyclo, uh, tacrolimus ointment 0.1% on the lids of these patients, and I find even the GPC, GPC resolves well, but then the result is not dramatic. You probably will have to be long drawn depending upon the severity of the GPC you're looking at. So the, uh, so the, 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 the decrease in the GPC severity could be anywhere starting from two to four weeks or six weeks here. But then definitely starts becoming quiescent and most of my patients are doing well. And this is a good alternative to taking the patient to the theater more frequently. I keep it for a longer period of time. The lid edema, the lid inflammation all goes down and the patients become more quiescent and they are more tolerant to the therapy. At, uh, but then again, it's only effective as long as they are using it. I have patients, once they stop using it, and those who have a propensity for uh, frequent recurrences, it starts occurring. But then this is probably an alternate therapy to putting a child on a systemic immunosuppressant therapy long term. You have those moderate to severe cases where you're still thinking, do I need to push this child into a systemic immunosuppressant? So where a trial of this works and then you could keep it on for a long period of time, it perhaps helps to save that bracket of patients rather than pushing them into uh, systemic immunosuppressant therapy. So that's something which uh, we did find and we looked at tear tacrolimus levels after therapy or, or for these patients. This is probably going to come out in the next issue of cornea as well. And, uh, and this, I do find, is a good alternative and works well in pediatric patients. It also works well in those patients with VKC, where you want your ocular surface inflammation to be as low as possible before you want to do a C3R for these patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vanity, for those uh, inputs. And Vaskar, thanks so much.